Psalm 143 today and, and that's the kind of prayer that David's praying. He's saying, help me God, you're my only hope. You're my only hope. Now, I don't know about you, do I have any fellow Star Wars fans in the house? If I can get it right. Woo! Who says, help me, you're my only hope? Can anyone tell me? Sign. Leia does. She says, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. Okay, we're not talking about Star Wars today, although I love Star Wars and used to go to Star Wars. All the new releases, Jesse Mould, you have that for me. Thank you. Excellent. Help me, God, you're my only hope. This is, this, that's what she says before that statement, and, and I thought that was cool. This is our most desperate hour. Very cool. All right, so we're talking about Psalm 143, and we're going to jump straight into it. So if you've got a Bible... A tangible physical Bible in the house today. Hold it up. Ooh, good job. If you don't have your Bible with you, you can use your phone app, as long as you're not looking at other things on your phone. Otherwise, it'll be up here on the screen behind me. Today, we're going to read from the psalm. And I may have to use my glasses every now and then. All right. Help me, Lord, you're my only hope. Psalm 143 verses 1 and 2 says, Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In your faithfulness and righteousness, come to my relief. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. David begins with a cry, a cry for the Lord to listen. But he sets the groundwork right away. He's clear on the groundwork. He understands that if God's going to answer me at all, it's because he's faithful, I'm not. In your faithfulness, verse 1 said, and righteousness, come to my relief. David says in verse 2, don't look at my life, because if it depended on how good I am, or the eloquence of the prayers I pray, or even the state of my heart that you can't see at times, then I'm in trouble. God's not going to answer any of us, right? Because none of us are righteous, it says. It depends on his goodness. If we come to the Lord based on any of that stuff, our faithfulness or figuring out that we can drum up a response from God, we won't see God's hand at work. So when we pray, we address this truth first. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve an answer. Ooh, that cuts across some stuff, doesn't it? Everything God gives us is by his mercy and his grace. We live by the grace of God. That's our confession. We live by the grace of God. You might have been tempted to sit and wonder why why hasn't God answered me? What do I need to do? Do I need to do something to make him answer me? Do I need to pray harder? Do I need to, you know, like act differently? I'm very Christian, you know. Um, Do I need to do, what do I need to do to earn God's response? Well, this is a foolish understanding of God. David starts off this way because he's been around for a while now and he knows that he doesn't get because he deserves to get he gets because God is good say it with me God is good that's why he is answered by the Lord verse 3 says the enemy pursues me he crushes me to the ground he makes me dwell in the darkness like those long dead So my spirit grows faint within me. My heart within me is dismayed. You know, David's driven by circumstance to pray this prayer, but he's confident based on the goodness of God to care for him, not on his own goodness. He tells the Lord, who knows everything, all of his concerns, all of his worries, all of his woes. He tells him as he sees it, he lays his cares down before the Lord. And what we see is the enemy has been pursuing David's soul. We don't know who the enemy was. Some 
Some, it, it says that it could, could have been Absalom, his son, could have been Saul, King Saul, previous king. It could have been the Philistines. We don't actually know who the enemy was, but David was being targeted. You know, behind the scenes, it's always this way, isn't it? We have an enemy. We have one enemy. His name's Satan. Your enemy is not your husband. Your enemy is not your wife. Your enemy is not your boss. Your enemy is not your children. Your enemy is not your parents. Your enemy is not your teacher. Your enemy is not your neighbor or the person sitting next to you today. But David has been the target of an enemy who's been harassing him, who's been um, bothering him, who's been um, causing him, opposing him and trying to destroy him. And that's what our enemy, the devil, will try and do, destroy our life, if at all possible. And certainly destroy anything, try to destroy anything that God's doing in us or disrupt it. But David was realizing that this, his confession in this psalm was that this is harder than he remembered, this harassment. And he, in this book, this is a poetry book, the Psalms, he uses really strong language like, I'm feeling crushed. Make, make me dwell in the darkness. Another version says like in the grave. He was feeling like he was walking in the dead, like walking with the dead. He was feeling empty. My spirit grows faint. It's like, you know, my life is ebbing away. My heart is dismayed. And what we, we, we can see is the warfare is required. The warfare, re- this required help. You know, the enemy is stronger than we are. Don't worry, I'm not going to leave it there. The enemy is stronger than we are. We can't overcome him on our own. If we could, we'd be all amazing, wouldn't we? Be different. But we're told to put on the whole armor of God. That we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And David understood this. He starts off. I know I don't deserve your help, but I'm in a bad way here. And he's brought to prayer by the circumstances of the battle. But if you look, he's forced to turn to the Lord, which is a refuge higher than him, and he was the king. He prays. You know, our circumstances might drive us to God in prayer. To have confidence in the goodness of God. Unfortunately for most of us, we wait to pray until it's the last resort. (laughs) Prayer often isn't the first step, it's the final step in the process. Help me God, you're my only hope. And as a result, by the time we pray, we're panicking. I need help. I don't know what to do. There's desperation in our voices. We can't seem to get through it or over it because we've waited so long to let God handle it. And we've tried to handle it on our own. But if we can learn to pray and come into his presence seeking him a whole lot earlier, more quickly, desperation won't be your common experience. Victory will be sweeter. You know, notice that David's harassment or his trouble, it, w- it was prolonged. He was saying it was, it's been going on for a long time. This is a serious issue. Things aren't getting better. They're just getting worse. There's no move. I'm not able to move. No light at the end of the tunnel. I'm at the end of my rope. Ever had these thoughts run through your mind? Yeah. Verse 4 said, my spirit grows faint and my heart is dismayed. Another version says, overwhelmed and distressed. He'd exhausted all of his resources. Reached my limit. I'm on prayer, the slide prayer. An end of my strength. The problems that I face persist. No relief in sight. Truly overwhelmed. No matter how capable you are, capable you are, that you think of handling situations in life, let me assure you that God will put you in a position 
where you will come up against this, where you will have to face, I can't do this on my own. I need God. That's the big lesson to learn. God can do what we cannot do. That's the place where all my resources fall short. I've no, I don't have anything left. I've given everything a go of myself. And I'm brought to this point where I cry out to the Lord, help me God, you're my only hope. Or I die. Experience, this is, this is the experience speaking. The, I'm at the end of my rope. I wonder if, if you've been there. My heart within me is distressed. Verse 5. I remember the days of long ago. I meditate on all your works and consider what your hands have done. I spread out my hands towards you. I thirst for you like a parched land. Remember. David's come to this place where he's able to remember, meditate, and think about, consider. He's looking at the past. David remembers the past, the time when he slew the lion and he killed the bear protecting the sheep. And he brags these things to Saul and he says, because God was with me. Because God was with me, I was able to do these things. The victory was his because God was with me. You know, how could he have killed Goliath with just a stone? Because God was with him. He was able to jump out of the way of the javelin while he was playing worship music for Saul who was just in a mess. Because God's anointing was with him and he was with him. Wow. This isn't a passive look back at, par- at history. It's not just looking at some photos and say, oh, wasn't that nice? It was such a lovely day. Oh, that was so beautiful. This is not that. It's not a, nor is it a stagnating, wallowing, you know, just dwelling on the troubles of the past, dredging up that stuff. This is an intentional faith-stirring moment, cheering what has the Lord already done? What has he done? What's he, what's he, he said? What has he said? What has he already done and completed? You know, I've got some things that I would, I've just been remembering. I remember the time when he helped me, and I think I've shared this before, but I remember there was a whole group of us walking along um, about this much, this much water, and we were in the ocean, and um, the tide was out, and um, there was rough play, and um, there's a, we were young adults at the time, and somebody lost their keys, which we didn't realize till we got back to the car. And so we prayed there at the car, and we walked back out there. Now, it's almost impossible to walk exactly in the same place, yeah. right, where those keys were. But I stepped on them. That was a miracle. Remember the time when God found those keys. Remember the time, the day when, when I was called to ministry to disciple love and care for people and his house. Remember the monthly prayers saying, God, we want to have a baby. We want to conceive. I've got two sons. It happened. It took a while, but we've got sons. God answered our prayer. Remember the time when he provided a box of food? When We weren't sure if we'd make it. This is very early on in the piece. We weren't sure if we were going to make it through to the next payday, but there was a box of food on our front doorstep. We hadn't told anyone. Remember the time. Remember the day. Oh, God spoke to me through Pastor David Cartledge. Does anyone remember David Cartledge? Yeah, Pastor David Cartledge. And he said to me, that I would have a backbone of steel to stand tall when others would bend. And there's been days when, you know what, we're still standing. Praise God, we're still standing. Remember the day, oh, there's so many things, so many things. Remember the day. Can you remember what God's done? In you might be little things, might be big things. What has he done in you? What has he done for you? Remember the day. Remember the day when I prayed for Tony and many people prayed for Tony, Pastor Tony, because he'd had a motorbike accident. And the 
veins and, and arteries in his leg had been crushed. And they were talking about amputating his leg because it was, you know, they were just not sure if it was going to um, flow again as it should. Well, Pastor Tony has two legs. <laughs> the prayers of the saint. Remember what God has done. Remember what God has done. You know, in my late teens, my early 20s, um, my home church, uh, God, God was moving very powerfully in that place. And it was experiencing a strong outpouring of Holy Spirit. And it was the time where, you know, there was some things happening with um, Pastor Rod- Rodney Howard Brown and, you know, the whole, there was lots of um, strong moves of Holy Spirit and was being outpoured. And, and our church was experiencing something quite similar and you know, our church was full every, every Sunday. Our church was full. People were praising and worshipping for extended periods of time. We just, it just couldn't stop. It just wouldn't stop. And, and that was a good thing. And, you know, not only was that happening, there were actually like salvations happening in, the, in that time. And, and, but there was some weird stuff that also went on with that. You know, when heaven meets humanity, there's, there's a little bit of silly that goes on. Like there's some barking like dogs and people barking and just weird things, weird things. But I remember that for me, there was a moment when um, God just, I, I just couldn't stand up under the power of God anymore. So I'm lying down on the floor at church because God does that sometimes. And, and there was this sense that there were, he was birthing something in me spiritually. And I've got to admit, oh, there was some grunting and groaning happening. <laughs> if you've given birth to a child, you know that there's grunting and groaning that happens in, in some cases. But I believe that there was a spiritual transformation. Something was birthed in my life that day. And I believe Holy Spirit was at work in that time. I know he was at work in that time. I could say yes. I, I, I long for those days. I remember those days. Those were the days of confidence, joy and hope. And it's not like that right now. It's difficult sometimes just to get people to show up to church every week. To show up on time or read their Bible. It's, it's a bit like an entirely different time, different season. I don't want to go back there. But I'd love to see something new happen. And there's a stirring. That was then and this is now. I'm going to invite someone. This is Abigail to the platform. And Abigail Abigail has just been at one of those stirrings. And she's on worship leader mic, if that's okay. Abigail was at Planet Shakers Conference this week and Planet Boom Conference with our youth team and Pastor Jason and Ethan and um, I, we're just so blessed and, and God did something mighty in many of the young people there. But I've invited Abigail just to share a short testimony of what God did for her. And so Abigail, Abby, Cap, yeah. as yes. you're affectionately known, <laughs> we're remembering what God's done. What, what, in just a few couple of sentences, what? did God do for you this last couple of days? Yeah, well, um, basically, Planet Broom's amazing, by the way. Make sure you come next year. But um, basically, I had lost my card at the shopping centre and I was in major panic mode. Um, And I told myself, like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Um, And right after that, we were heading to Planet Shakers and, you know... When you're in God's presence, all of that time just doesn't exist. All that doubt, the fear, the panic that I was having, it didn't exist. Um, And right there, I just gave it all to God and none of that mattered because God's so much more. He's over all of that and it doesn't matter. That's so good. And when in in worship and stuff, like that's, is that where he gave you? That, that sense of confirmation. Yeah, or, yeah, 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 yeah. All I could feel in my heart was joy and just praising the Lord in that moment in His presence. That's all I could think about. Yeah, come on. Praise God. That's awesome. Thanks, Abby. That's good.
Thank you. That's so good. You know, David longed for the days of old, and sometimes I think the older I get, the easier it is to trust God. Is that true? That's a misconception. <laughs> uh, yeah, the battles are different, but um, there's still battles, hey? There's still this honesty of, of knowing that I need to trust Him no matter what every day. You know, we sometimes think God's not doing anything this time. So David's come to this point where he's thirsting for God to answer him. Sorry, do you mind not playing for me just at the moment? That'd be really good. Thank you. But God's not doing anything this time. He feels like David's just at the end of himself. He's, he's, um, and so he's thirsting for the Lord to answer him. And um, this moment, it, it actually, in, in the Bible, I didn't write it up there on the screen and I should have, but at the end of this verse, it says sealer. And we know that when that, that word comes up, it's stop and think before you go on. It's a Hebrew musical note. And so we're going to look at verse 7. So we're looking at verse 7. It says this, Answer me quickly, Lord, my spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, or I will be like those who go down to the pit. Answer me quickly. God, I'm going through it, David says. I realize it's not my goodness that will allow you to answer me, but your goodness. I remember how it used to be, and I long for it again. So this is a moment where they have to, where David's just in this waiting. It's not going to happen quickly. He's already realized that. And so he's waiting for God's presence. He's waiting for God to, to come. In Hebrews 10, 35, it says this, Don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. And Hebrews 6 says this, We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what God has promised. You know, David's at this place where if he says, Lord, if you hide your spirit from me now, I'm going to die. I'm going to be like those who go down to the pit. If you don't come through, it's too late. And Paul's, um, those verses that I just read, Paul was addressing in his letters to the church of Rome, the Christians, the Hebrews there, who, who were being persecuted. They'd been kicked out of Rome and they were, they were at the end of themselves. They thought Jesus was coming back in their lifetime and he hadn't come back. And they were dismayed. They were frustrated. They didn't know what was going on. And that's where Paul says to them, don't throw away your confidence. Persevere. Show this same diligence to the very end. Don't be lazy, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Paul said lots in his letters. <sighs> Who likes being told to wait? That's, that, is that the best counsel you've ever heard? You, you just got to wait, man. Hang in there. Persevere. All right. He was urgent in the crying out, but God sometimes has us waiting. He wants us to wait. So we're going to watch a video. Hey, everyone. Today we're going to do a cake smash. Woohoo! It's going to be awesome. Inside this cake is our clue. If you think you see it, then wave your hands in the air. Let's count down together. Ready? Three, two, one, smash! Oh, this cake is Funfetti. Awesome! Okay, let's look out for our clue. Do you see it? Oh, hey, there it is. Let's see what's inside. It's a name tag, and it says, Abraham. This clue reminds me of today's Bible story, when God made a covenant and changed Abram's name to Abraham. Okay, everyone, stand on your feet. It's time to jump into the Bible. One, two, three, jump!
This is Abram, who will later be known as Abraham. Hey. When Abram was in the land called Canaan, God told him to look over the land as far as his eyes could see. God promised that the land would be blessed and that Abram would have many children. Ah. 25 years passed. Abram and Sarai were very old and still had no children. God appeared to Abram and said, Don't be afraid. I'm your shield. A son is coming. Look at the heavens and count the stars. Someday you will have as many children as there are stars in the sky. Then God told Abram that his name would no longer be Abram, but it would be Abraham, which means father of many nations. God also told Abraham that Sarai's name would be changed to Sarah. God promised to bless Sarah and told Abraham that she would become pregnant and have a son. God made a covenant with Abraham that day. His covenant was a promise that Abraham would have many sons and they would be blessed. There's a part of that story that wasn't reflected in that little clip for the kids. Where Abraham thought he should take matters into his own hands. And he went and found his wife's handmaiden, Hagar, and he had a son with her and named him Ishmael. Then he presented Ishmael to the Lord. There you go, Lord. Thanks for the boy. But that wasn't God's answer. The Lord said, that's not my choice. I told you I would do this. And God refused Abraham's help. Fourteen years later, Abraham is a hundred, and the Lord said, you, can you help me now? No. All right. Well, good. Let's see what we can do. At the end of yourself, maybe now I can work. And Abraham has a child at a hundred years old and names him Laughter. Who wouldn't he, who, who wouldn't? He and his wife both giggled. Look what we just did. We're a hundred. When your spirit is failing and you've run out of ideas, you're about as close to seeing God's hand moving as you've ever been. That's it. Come on. Urgent in crying out, but yet God sometimes has us waiting. He wants us to wait. All right. When your spirit is failing... And you've run out of ideas. You're about as close to seeing God's hand move as you've ever been. But you have to get there to that point to see what God wants to do. You've got to be in that difficult spot of surrender. The face of the Lord in the poetic sense always speaks about his favor, about his blessing, about his attention or approval. And and God hears David's concern. The Lord doesn't turn his back on you today. His back's not turned towards you. He hasn't abandoned you. He hasn't left you. He's with you. He's going to show you. He show we, Our prayer is, show me your face, God. Show me your glory. And he's going to pour out his favor and his blessing upon you. Verse 8 says this, Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. Unfailing love. You know, sometimes we're in the midst of it, in the midst of our challenge, our hardship, our whatever it is that's caused us to come to this point of, help me, Lord. We can't actually hear because it's like a dog that's enraged and it won't even listen to the person it's trying to protect because it's just seeing red. It can't hear. It's the one it loves because it's just seeing red. And we need Holy Spirit to cut through the fog. Cause me to hear your loving kindness, another version says. We lose sight of who he is sometimes. And I tell you what, little can stumble you when you're sure of God's love. When you're sure of who he is and how he loves you. David has been so down 
and he couldn't hear the goodness of God for him. But God loves you full stop. There's no if, buts, and maybes. God loves you. You're a child of God, as Pastor Jason said. The Bible's full of, um, if the Lord is with you, why fear what man can do to you? Don't fear, I'll be with you. The Bible's full of God's promises. It's just hearing them in the midst of that red zone. That's the challenge. <laughs> Loudly we say, I'll trust you, Lord. But in our hearts we're thinking, I've still got a few things I can try. I've got these backup plans and I'll do this and I'll do this and I'll do this. But we have to come to the end of ourselves to come to the point where we say, not on my terms anymore. I can't do this. This is out of my control. Are you ready for God's help yet? Verse 9 says, Rescue me from my enemies, Lord, for I hide myself in you. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. You would think as a Christian that the only sensible thing would be to find out what God wants us to do and then go do it, right? It seems simple. But sometimes we try and persuade God on our terms. Well, I've got this, this and this. I was thinking, you know, that, that one might work. What do you think, God? Is that okay? Should I give that a go? And, and so we try and do things on our terms and we, can, and we say, here, Lord, look, here's a, a prayer I wrote up for you suggestion here lord i've written up a few things you might want to consider i like numbers four five and six you might take a look at those i've highlighted them underlined them and put them in caps amen teach me to do your will your will god teach me to do your will you know this is where we find ourselves just wanting to be in his presence because that's where the answers are don't hide away from your problems, but do hide yourself in God. Find yourself in God, in his presence. Do hide yourself in God. Teach me to do your will. Be teachable. Ask people. If you don't know, ask godly for counsel. We're all on a journey, so we're all learning. But hopefully someone will say, what does the Bible say about this? Hopefully someone will say, well, let's talk to Jesus right now. And you can pray together and ask God for counsel. Because his spirit, it says his good spirit will lead you on level ground. David is here. He's on the scene. He's under pressure. He's longing to be taught by God what to do. Verse 11. I'm nearly there. For your name's sake, Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring me out of trouble. Uh, in your unfailing love, silence my enemies. Destroy all my foes, for I am your servant. This is what I believe God's given me, this statement. I am your servant. I am your servant. This is my quote for the year. This is what God's just, I'm your servant. I'm your servant. So I'm not boasting in any of my abilities or my lack, but I'm boasting only in God because I'm your servant, God. I do what I want to do. I want to do well, only what you tell me to do. I want to honour you with my life. I'm your servant. I'm at my best when I'm following you. And in these verses... David's prayer is, bring my soul out of trouble. He's, he's desperate. And he says these th phrases, come to me, God. Answer me, show me, rescue me, teach me, preserve me. He's no longer seeking to bend the will of God to David's ways, to what he's doing. He wants to, he wants to be bent by the will of God. He wants to surrender to the will of God. He wants to flow with what God's plan for him is. That's always the best purpose in prayer and how we approach God's presence. It's not always the answer to prayer. That's the be all and end all. It's who I become through it. I love this. Just think what would happen if everyone got what they wanted in prayer. There'd be conflict, wouldn't there? 
Here's a, here's a joke for you. Three guys on a deserted island with a magic lamp. The genie says, everyone gets a wish. Are you thinking what you'd wish? The first guy says, I want to go home to London. And he was gone. Second guy says, I want to go home to Rome. And he was gone. Third fella looks around and says, I'm lonely. I want my friends back. I thought you'd like that one, Pastor Ian. (laughs) If you're out of options this morning and Jesus is your only choice, then you're in a good place. If like David to God, to Yahweh, or Princess Leah to Obi-Wan Kenobi, your prayer is, help me, you're my only hope then you're about to see God do something great. But if you've still got some ideas and you're here going, well, I'll give this to you, Lord, unless you don't want it, I'll handle it, then you're probably, you're probably not ready. You're not at the end of your rope. You might have to wait a little bit longer. But David finds himself here this morning, crushed in darkness, overwhelmed and distressed, Well, you know, it's actually a great place to be because that's where God meets us. Don't fight it. Find him in it. Find him in it. Find him in it. All right. Thank you, Ethan. You can start playing. Actually, there's a song that came to my mind when I was preparing this message. And it's an old song. And um, the the lyrics, I'm not going to sing it. Because I don't have anyone. Nobody knew it. None of our worship team knew it on the platform. Oh, no, did you know it, Leona? Yeah. But it said, it goes like this. I'm just going to say, when the darkness fills my senses, when my blindness keeps me from your touch, Jesus, come. When my burden keeps me doubting, when my memories take the place of you, Jesus, come. And I'll follow you there to the place where we meet and I'll lay down my pride as you search me again, your unfailing love, your unfailing love, your unfailing love, your unfailing love. This morning, I want to invite you to stand to your feet right now. And we're going to, I'm going to just pray a prayer. And then we're going to worship. And at the end of that worship time, I, I just want to invite you. You might be just, you've been just thinking, whoa, I'm there. I've been fighting it and I need to just give it to him. And so you might need to come to the front for prayer. Or you might need to kneel where you are. and just, Or just put your hands up. Say, God, I need you. So I'm going to just pray this prayer. And then we're going to sing just a short part of the worship song. And at the end of that time, we're going to keep worshipping. We're going to have some worship music playing. But I believe that God wants to do something significant today. I believe there's a breakthrough today in, in the supernatural and our expectancy for, for a shift for what God is, is doing. You know, my senior pastor at that time where God was moving powerfully um, at that home church. He used to say that God could do something. He would speed up the process supernaturally, what might take years in just clinical counselling, for example. That God could do the miraculous when His power was at work in our lives. That He could speed up process of restoration, of healing, of just shifting things from us. And so today I believe that God's stirring in people's hearts today. And that the supernatural God, our our creator, our amazing God, heaven wants to meet your humanity today. And so let's pray. Let's close our eyes. Father God, we thank you for the goodness of your spirit working in us how faithful you are, how good you are. 
And yet, how often we need to taste and see that the Lord's kindness and goodness is found in when we have come to the end of ourselves. When we have nothing to offer, no place to turn. We just feel like if you don't work, we're just going to die. We find ourselves at rest in you. Thank you for your calling. Thank you that you're bringing us through some deep water. There's a work being done that though it's uncomfortable, through it all we come closer to real, pure faith in trusting you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's worship. We're going to worship. And then I invite you to come for prayer. If you'd like team to pray for you, I'd love the planet, the crew that went to Planet Shakers to pray for people. I'd love Pastor Ian and Kim to pray for people. But if you've got a just, if you want, if you want someone to stand with you today, then um, we're going to pray. Shout Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name. Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, and Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus, your name is power, your name is healing, your Today our service is finished formally and you're welcome to head on out for a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. If you don't want to, if you want to, you're welcome to do that. Thank you.